As you no doubt know from our publicity, our theme for this year is the church and the media. Well, when we in the 20th century hear the words communications media, what naturally springs to our minds are the pioneering ways that we use media to communicate with one another. I'm talking about, you know, DVDs, digital television, cell phones, text messaging, Blackberries, all the things I hope you've all turned off before coming in to hear our talk <laughs> this evening. But sometimes we forget that things like parchment and papyrus are also forms of communications media. In fact, those things were real innovations in the course of human history when those things were first introduced. Indeed, the very existence of the Bible depends on ancient technologies for writing. And it is this very interesting topic that Dr. Hahn will address this evening. The topic of his talk is called Papyrus and Parchment, Technologies of Writing and the Bible. It's always a pleasure for me to introduce to you a colleague of mine here in the Department of Theology. Dr. Hahn did not start out in theology, it may come as a surprise to some of you, but rather his early degree work was in English. Um, so he did some degrees in English and then worked for a stint as a professional writer for the Wisconsin um, Catholic Conference. Uh, so a word to the wise for all you students uh, who are writing papers for Dr. Hahn, uh, don't even think about sloppy grammar, he, he knows too much. Dr. Hahn then decided to um, pursue a doctoral degree in theology, which he did at Marquette University, receiving that degree in 1990, that same year he was hired by the University of St. Thomas, and he's been with us ever since. Dr. Hahn has served as a former chair of the theology department. He has also held the Scanlon Chair in Theology. Um, he, his main area is sacred scripture, and he teaches many courses in this area, but he is also uh, taught Christian anthropology and world religions. Please join me then in welcoming um, an, an old friend to the Lenten Lecture Series, Dr. Paul Hahn. Well, good evening. Quite a nice crowd tonight. Uh, which was it that got you here, the papyrus or the parchment? <laughs> uh, I need this for future reference. But of course, what got you here was the last word in my title, which is Bible. And what I want to concentrate on this evening is how the developing ability to write and to um, transmit the Holy Scriptures through the centuries uh, affected it and enabled us to have the Bible as we have it now today. Does everyone happen to have a uh, handout? It has a outline of the talk this evening. I thought since it's a fair amount of material I'll be covering, I thought it might be to some advantage uh, to have the major topics that we'll be looking at. We begin with some scripts. Methods of writing, we've all heard of hieroglyphs, of course. Hieroglyphs originated about 3000 BC. They are uh, pictograms, pictures. Um, they are also called logograms. Each picture equals one word. Originally, there were about 800 hieroglyphs. By the time you get to the Greek and Roman period, when Jesus was alive, there had developed up to 5,000 of them. But the hieroglyphs were only one of the methods of writing, one of the scripts that the Egyptians developed in ancient times. Another is called hieratic. Hieratic uh, priestly writing was not done on stone, as the hieroglyphs were, but instead was done on papyrus, much more like our paper. Consequently, instead of the rather angular hieroglyphics, uh, hieratic is a much more cursive script. A third 
ancient Egyptian script, which did not develop until around the time of Christ, is called Demotic because it was the writing of the people, the populace, and it is even more cursive. Egypt is at the bottom of the Fertile Crescent, as it's called, that area that had special fertility of land. At the top of the Fertile Crescent is Mesopotamia, which consisted of Assyria in the north and Babylonia in the south. Mesopotamia developed its own script, which is now called cuneiform, from the Latin word cuneus, which means wedge. Reeds would be uh, snipped, and when cut, they would, they would result in a wedge shape. So the medium upon which this script was written was clay. Consequently, the um, small triangle at the end of the reed could be punched into the clay horizontally, vertically, at an angle. The corner could be used, etc. So an entire script, how to write in wedge form, cuneiform, developed. Writing was actually invented by the Sumerians who preceded the Assyrians and Babylonians in Mesopotamia about 3200, about 100 years before the Egyptians. A third script I'd like to mention is the alphabet. The alphabet developed probably in the 1600s BC, possibly 1500s. The original alphabet was invented by the Canaanites, those peoples whom the Israelites conquered uh, in the conquest after the Exodus. The original alphabet is called Proto-Canaanite. From it, there evolved a alphabet that was used by the neighbors to the north, the Phoenicians, the Phoenician alphabet. And from the Phoenician alphabet, the Hebrews derived their alphabet. Uh, also from the Phoenicians, the Greeks derived their alphabet. It's for this reason that F.M. Cross has said, the invention of the Proto-Canaanite alphabet was an act of stunning innovation, a simplification of writing which must be called one of the great intellectual achievements of the ancient world. The Paleo-Hebrew alphabet showed up about 1,000, the Greek alphabet around 800, and the Latin alphabet about 600. Now let's return for a moment to the clay tablets and consider uh, what they were like. Clay is about the cheapest material you could come up with to write on. It's also ubiquitous, it's also durable when heated. As I said, um, it began maybe about 3200 BC. The form hardly changed over the millennia. It remained square, the size of the square being determined by the content. Some cuneiform clay tablets are an inch square, others are almost 18 inches square. The clay tablets were dried in the sun unless they were especially important and you wanted them to be especially durable, in which case you would fire up a kiln and put the clay tablet in and it would become especially hardened. The direction of writing back in the time of the clay tablets had not yet been established. The ordinary way to write in cuneiform on a clay tablet if you were a scribe, a Sumerian or Assyrian or Babylonian scribe, would be to start in the upper left corner of the front of the tablet, write a column all the way across to the bottom, turn it on end, write across the bottom, one or two lines, flip it over, write the next lines from right to left, flip it again, write across the top, 
And if you still have more to say, you write up the left side and then down the right side. One advantage of clay tablets was erasure. It's very easy to erase. We've all played with clay when we were in kindergarten. You simply use your thumb and get rid of a litter. If you wanted to make a, a series of clay tablets, let's say that you have an unusually long text, like the Epic of Gilgamesh, one of the, probably the earliest epic, um, certainly the earliest epic extant, then you would simply put it on a series of tablets. At the end of tablet one, you would say, this is tablet one, you tell the total number of tablets that are in the series, and you would also include the first line of the next tablet. That way they would never wind up out of order or you could reassemble them in the correct order. It is very unlikely that any part of the Bible was ever written on clay tablets. But this does not mean that clay tablets did not exist in ancient Israel. There is considerable evidence that they did. We have, for example, six clay inscriptions which date from 1800 BC to 1550. This was the time of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Jacob's 12 sons. Uh, four of these inscriptions were found at the city of Hazor. There's a clay tablet with a judicial, judicial judgment. Uh, there's a, an inscribed model liver. Sounds kind of curious. There's a liver, not from a human, but from a uh, sheep or a goat, modeled in clay, and then various portions of it are sectioned off. This was used to tell the future. So if I were a Babylonian priest and you had some question about the future, is my business trip going to go well? You would come to me, we would sacrifice a sheep, we would uh, rescue the liver, and by examining it, where are the protuberances, etc., I could divine, based on this model, uh, what's going to happen on your trip. We also have a set of clay tablets which were actually found in Egypt. They're called the Amarna letters. They were found in Amarna, Egypt, which happened to be the capital of Akhenaten. Akhenaten was that pharaoh in the 1300s who imposed or tried to impose monotheism. You remember this. Uh, he said there's no god but Ra, R-A. Immediately after he died, the very powerful Egyptian priesthood defaced all of his statues and tried to get rid of his notion. Uh, what's interesting about these letters is even though they're found in Egypt, they're written by various city-states in the Holy Land. They're written to the Pharaoh because Egypt had extended its hegemony over uh, what we nowadays would call the Holy Land or the Levant. It's mostly diplomatic correspondence, but there are some interesting references in it to the style of life of the peoples in those cities. Ugarit is a city which flourished in what today would be Lebanon, just north of present-day Israel. It flourished from about 1400 <clears throat> to 1200. It was destroyed by an earthquake in 1195. But fortunately, thousands of clay tablets in its library and in its temple survived and have been recovered. This is our best source of knowledge about the Canaanites because the Phoenicians, this was a Phoenician city, were first cousins to the Canaanites, spoke the same language, wrote the same way, etc. It's there, for example, that we have found references to El, E-L. The name of God in the Old Testament is sometimes El.
We have found clay tablets in a variety of Canaanite cities. One um, discovery that we've made just less than a year ago, in fact, seven months ago, in July, uh, a Viennese Assyriologist was poking around in the British Museum clay tablets, of which there are tens of thousands, and he came across a little one. It's only uh, two inches by four inches, but it makes a reference to Nebuzaradan, and it turns out Nebuzaradan is mentioned in the Bible. He's mentioned in Jeremiah chapter 39. Here's what it says. Then Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, exiled to Babylon the rest of the people who were left in the city, those who had deserted to him and the people who remained. Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, left in the land of Judah some of the poor people who owned nothing, and he gave them vineyards and fields at the same time. King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, who was Nebuzaradan's overlord, gave command concerning Jeremiah through Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, saying, take him, look after him well, and do him no harm, but deal with him as he may ask you. So here we see, um, just six months ago, a discovery that relates directly to the Bible. Uh, it, it does not have any biblical text on it, but it, it makes reference to someone who actually shows up in the Bible. Clay tablets were not the only medium on which communication was made in ancient times. Another medium was wood. Wood is a problem because unlike clay, it's highly perishable, so we don't have a lot of records of it. The German tribes, for example, primarily wrote on wood. They adopted the Latin alphabet around 500 BC or so, but because they wrote on wood, which is much easier to write on with a knife in slashes rather than curves, they changed the alphabet of the Latins into what we call runes. Uh, in fact, our word book comes from balk, which meant beech tree. Even the word beech comes from that same root. Even the word bark comes from that same root. Our word to write comes from German ritan, which means to scratch or draw on wood. The Romans, back in their earliest days, also wrote on bark. In fact, their word liber means the inside of bark, which is what they used as a writing surface. From liber came libelus, which means a little book. And from these two terms, liber and libelus, have come a variety of terms in our language that have to do with writing. Library, for example, or libretto from libelus, or libel comes from liber, or the Spanish word for a bookstore, which is Liberia, yes, also comes from these terms. So if the Romans had not written on wood, we wouldn't know what to call these things. <laughs> we also know they wrote on leaves, the leaves that they would pluck from trees. The Latin word for leaf is folium. And so from that Latin word, we get the word folio. We also get the word leaf from li in folio, or folium. We also get the word foil. However, interesting as that is, there's no uh, writing on wood that we know of, of biblical texts. Another medium was bronze. 
Bronze is a melting together in the same clay pot of some tin and some copper. Tin is rather malleable, copper is rather malleable, bronze is quite hard. We have discovered five bronze arrowheads in ancient Israel. They date from somewhere around 1100 to 1000 BC, which was the time of David. Four of these five arrowhead, bronze arrowheads that we have discovered have on them, inscribed on them, Gabed Lebait. Lebait means lioness. And we know from the Bible that David had some mercenary soldiers who were called lions, archers. For example, Psalm 57, 4 says, I lie down among lions, Lebait, that greedily devour human prey. Their teeth are spears and arrows, their tongues sharp swords. Well, it's interesting to note <clears throat> that the date corresponds with David, that the reference to lions corresponds with David's mercenaries, and that these were discovered in Bethlehem, a few miles south of Jerusalem, which is where David was born. So could it be that this reference to uh, the mercenary lions might actually refer to David's uh, actual mercenaries? Another medium is stone. Obviously, you use stone if you want to do an imposing monument. Early Hebrew developed a stone style called lapidary proto-Hebrew. When something is really important, especially if it's of state importance, important to the state, or of religious importance, you put it on stone so that it will be next to eternal. And that's exactly what happened to treaties back then. If I, David, made a treaty with you, uh, king of Ramoth Gilead, then we would put that treaty on stone. Well, there was a treaty between God and Israel back then, which started with the Ten Commandments. And what were the Ten Commandments put on? Stone, two stone tablets. Unfortunately, although I have discovered the original ones, I forgot to bring them tonight. (laughs) Here's Deuteronomy 27. On the day that you cross over the Jordan into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, God says to Moses, or excuse me, Moses says to the Israelites, you shall set up large stones and cover them with plaster. You shall write on them all the words of this law, not just the Ten Commandments, but all 613 laws in the Mosaic law. You shall set up these stones on Mount Ebal and you shall cover them with plaster. Well, these would have been biblical texts. We have, however, discovered none of these. Um, Another interesting fact is that treaties in the ancient uh, Near East were stored in protective boxes. Where were the Ten Commandments put? Do you recall? Ark of the Covenant. So there, too, we have a connection here. We have found um, inscriptions which have been carved into tombs in Jerusalem. These are stone uh, communications. These curses uh, read like this. Here's an, an actual one of them that I'm using as an example. This is the sepulcher of, and the first half of his name is missing, the second half is Yahoo. His name was not Yahoo. <laughs> this is the sepulcher of Yahoo, who is over the house. There is no silver and no gold here. 
but his bones and the bones of his maid with him. Cursed be the man who will open this tomb. Would that suffice to dissuade you? <laughs> it would me. The most important stone um, communique that we have had come down to us from ancient Israel is an inscription on a, a massive engineering project which King Hezekiah undertook in the city of Jerusalem. He wanted to ensure that water would be available inside the city of Jerusalem from a well that was outside the city walls. So he dug a tunnel which went through the entire hill of the city of David that the city of David is on. It's six football fields long. I mean, we have dug tunnels through mountains to do our railroads and so on, but we had wonderful machines to do this. They had picks. It's amazing to think of. At the end of it, um, King Hezekiah had an inscription put at the entrance to the tunnel. Here's what it says. Oh, but by the way, we know about this tunnel not only because we have found it, but because it's referred to in the Bible. Second Kings 20, 20 says, uh, Hezekiah made the pool and the conduit and brought water into the city. He planned with his, this is uh, 2 Corinthians 32, he planned with his officers and his warriors to stop the flow of the springs that were outside the city. A great many people were gathered uh, because he did not want the Assyrians to find water. Here's the inscription. This was the matter of the tunnel. While the hewers wielded the axes, each man toward his fellow, they were digging from both sides of the mountain, hoping to meet in the middle. Fortunately, they did. And while there were still three cubits, that's a foot and a half each, to be hewn, there was heard a man's voice calling to his fellow. So there's not much left, and they can hear each other on each side. And on the day it was tunnel tunneled through, the hewers struck the rock, each man towards his fellow, axe against axe. And the water flowed from the spring towards the pool for 1,200 cubits, six football fields, and 100 cubits was the height of the rock above the heads of the hewers. A last um, type of communication that we have found on stone from ancient Israel is seals. Seals were inscribed on semi-precious stones. They were often circular or square. They were relatively small and they were used to make an impression on clay. So if I wrote a letter to someone and tied it up with string I would put some clay on the edge, push my seal, which might be embedded in my ring, and send it off to him, and that seal will tell him that this is from me. We have found quite a number of, not the seals themselves, we have a few of those, but mostly we have found the, the clay stamps. The letters have all rotted away, but the clay stamps have still remained. Interestingly enough, a number of these clay stamps, they're called bulle, B-U-L-L-A-E, one archaeologist said to another, look, I found some bulle. The other guy said, well, bulle for you. <laughs> these clay stamps, called bulle, turn out to have some names of people who are in the Bible. It was only the rich and prosperous who would have a need for this sort of stamp. And some of the head honchos who were in charge of Jerusalem in 587 when it was destroyed, we have actually found their clay stamps with their names on them. For example, Barak Yahu, son of Nuri Yahu the scribe is probably a reference to the person we call Baruch, but his actual name in Hebrew is Barachiahu. Jeramiel, the king's son, 
we presume that that is a reference to the son of King Jehoiakim, who was sent by Jehoiakim to arrest Jeremiah. Gemar Yahu, son of Shaphan, is mentioned in Jeremiah chapter 36, and Gedal Yahu over the house, probably the governor of Judah who was put in charge as a puppet by the Babylonians after the fall of Jerusalem. Ivory is the next material I'd like to mention briefly. Not a lot on ivory, but we had a very interesting discovery of a pomegranate-shaped ball of ivory. It's incised with miniature Hebrew letters, and it has on it Lebayit Yahweh Kadosh Kahanim, which means belonging to the temple of the Lord Yahweh, holy to the priests. The speculation is that this ball was on the top of a scepter that was used by the priests. If so, it is the, and it's pre-exilic, if so, then it's the only object that would have been directly connected with the first temple that has come down to us. That first temple was destroyed by the Babylonians in 587. Ostraka is the next um, material on which communications from the ancient Israelites have come down to us. Ostraka means broken pottery pieces. Doesn't sound like a very good thing to be writing on, but it had certain advantages. Pieces of pottery were everywhere back then. Pottery was rather fragile, broke, I might use a pot to cook several suppers in, it breaks, I make another one or buy another one. Uh, the streets were lined, the gutters had lots of these broken pottery pieces. So if you were a poor person, this was an excellent medium upon which to inscribe something. Can't get cheaper than free. It was also durable. It did, of course, have certain disadvantages. For one thing, you can't write a long text. You can only write a little bit on one piece of pottery. And it's inconvenient. It's irregularly shaped. You, you can't stack them. From the 1100s in Israel, we have found a Hebrew inscription on pottery, probably done by a schoolboy, because one of the lines of this inscription is simply the Hebrew alphabet. Aleph, Beth, Gimel, Daleth, etc. That's from the 1100s. Around 800 come another set of ostraka from the city of Samaria. Now Samaria, of course, we think of Samaritans. After David and Solomon, the 12 tribes of Israel split into two states. The northern state retained the name Israel, the southern state which was mostly the tribe of Judah, took the name Judah. Samaria wound up being the capital of that northern kingdom of Israel. This split of the 10 tribes and the two tribes occurred around 922 BC. So here we have a bunch of Ostraka pottery pieces which come from uh, around 800. They're all trade memoranda, they're all business documents. Uh, their tax accounts, that sort of thing. But they give us some insight into the culture at that time. For example, the personal names on those ostraka usually end with Yah or Baal, whereas in the south, in Judah, personal names usually ended with Yahu, which is a form of Yah, Yahweh. More ostraka have been found in three hill fortresses. Uh, either David or Solomon, or both, built a string of hill fortresses across the mountaintops as one goes from Jerusalem down toward Egypt. And uh, these are probably 
um, to exert military power over that area and keep the Egyptians out and so on. In one of these hill fortresses called Arad, which is about, it's square, it's about the size of a half a football field, we found records of taxes that they took in. These taxes were not Benjamins like you and I pay our taxes in. They paid, people back then paid in flour or in oil or in wine. And so we have the records of who paid how much flour, who paid how much oil, who paid how much wine. Arad, the fortress, also then dispersed these edibles to um, the army that was positioned at other hill fortresses. From another hill fortress called Kuntalet Gaudrud, there comes an inscription on a door jam. Somebody on the side of the door as he was going in scratched an inscription. What it, um, what probably was going on there is something that's one of the 613 laws in the Old Testament. In Deuteronomy chapter six, you have this passage. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead. Those are little leather boxes called tefillin. You've maybe seen Jewish men have those tied on their foreheads or on their arms. The next verse says, write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. I took one of my daughters when she was, I don't know, 10 or 11, off to visit a friend in another subdivision. And as I walked my daughter up to the door, there on the door jam was a little plaster box. And I immediately knew this is a mezuzot. A mezuzot is a, uh, a Jewish way of fulfilling that commandment. Had I opened it, it was sealed, but had I opened it, I would have found a little parchment scroll with the words, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is our only God. Most surprising of the finds at this hill fortress called Kuntalet Gadrid was an inscription on a piece of pottery which said, Levaya Shomrim Welashra, which translates Yahweh of Samaria and his Asherah. Asherah in the Old Testament is a goddess who is worshipped by the Canaanites. And we're told over and over again in the books of Samuel and the books of Kings especially, how various kings would try to cleanse the national religion of these other gods and goddesses that were constantly being adopted by the people. Uh, here we have somebody, probably some soldier who was assigned to that hill fort, who scratched on to this piece of pottery, Yahweh of Samaria and his Asherah. And it's accompanied by a picture, two kind of stick figures, one of whom is Yahweh, one of whom is Asherah. Needless to say, that fellow's theology was not orthodox. <laughs> In addition to pottery sherds or pieces of pottery, I want to mention silver because uh, that's a very unusual writing substance, but there's a very fascinating find that has been made in 1986. So this is only like two decades ago. Uh, a um, archaeologist came across in a tomb in Jerusalem two small silver talismans. You know, a talisman is like something you'd wear around your neck for good luck, that sort of thing. Well, these have tiny letters inscribed on them. They date from before 587 BC. We don't know how far back they go, but they're prior to the destruction of Jerusalem. 
And guess what they have on them? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. That's called the priestly benediction or the Aharonic uh, blessing. So that is our, that is our absolute earliest biblical verse that has still survived and come down to us. Isn't that fascinating? I mentioned 587 on your uh, list of topics there because this was really the second most important event in the entire Old Testament. Undoubtedly the most important event in the whole Old Testament is the Exodus because that was the major turning point in Israel's fortunes in the Old Testament. But the second most important event was the fall of Jerusalem when the Babylonians came in and completely destroyed the city of Jerusalem, including the temple, which had stood there for 400 years. Think about that. America's only been around for 200 years. Here you, you have your, your nation basically destroyed and all the leaders are taken off to Babylon to be kept in custody. Well, we have found some uh, on cave walls as you're as you're going from Jerusalem, which is up on a mountain, as you're going from Jerusalem either down to the west toward the coast of the Mediterranean, or as you're going down toward the east, toward the Jordan River, in caves on both sides of Jerusalem, we have found some inscriptions. And they seem to date from 587, because here's what one of them says. Oh, I don't have the exact quote, I apologize. But it includes a prayer to Yahweh and notes of concern for the fate of Jerusalem. So the supposition is these were refugees who were fleeing at, uh, in 587. Also concerning 587, remember Ostraka, those broken pieces of pottery shirt? We have found Ostraka in the major fortress not too far outside Jerusalem. It's a place called Lachish. And these ostraca turn out to be letters, very brief, of course, that they were either written from somebody outside Lachish speaking to his commander inside, or another theory is they were written by the commander of Lachish writing to the king in Jerusalem. Either way, he's warning about the destruction that's coming. He's asking advice, how to go about defending against it, and so on. So all of these ostraca date from around 589, just a little bit before the fall of Jerusalem. Now at this point I want to do a little digression. And I want to talk about references to Yahweh outside the Bible. Obviously we know about Yahweh from the Bible. These are references that are not made by Israelites, but they're made by neighbors of Israel. The earliest reference we have to Yahweh, perhaps, dates from before 1250. You know, Moses was alive in 1250, probably. So this is really ancient. We have found in Egyptian documents references to the word YHW3. All right, I don't know Egyptian. I don't know how to pronounce that. I don't even know why they use a three as a letter when they're transcribing Egyptian. At any rate, the Egyptologists, the ones who know about these things, tell the rest of us that this could be a reference to the word Yahweh. But it clearly, in context, is a reference to a geographical region east of Israel. In other words, southern Palestine. It was an, a region that was roamed by nomads called Shasu. And a lot of scholars now believe that the Israelites were originally part of that sort of nomadic class and um, derived from it. It's a very 
interesting hint, but it, unfortunately, not more than that. We have found a stone, upright, 10-foot-high black granite monument, which was made by the king of Moab. Moab was right next door to Israel during Old Testament times on the southeast. His name was King Mesha, and in it he brags about having defeated the Israelites. Here's what it says, quote, Chemosh said to me, go take Nebo from Israel. And I went in the night and fought against it from the daybreak until midday, and I took it and killed it all, 7,000 men and women and servants. Since for Ashtar Chemosh, I banned it. And from there, I took the vessels of Yahweh, and I brought them before Chemosh. Vessels of Yahweh, that would be those vessels that were used in the temple services. Now, this dates from about 850. So apparently, the temple was plundered in Jerusalem about 850 by this neighboring king. The earliest reference to Israel outside the Bible occurs in an Egyptian stone monument. It's called Merdepta Steel. S-T-E-L-E -E means a stone um, memorial. It dates from 1225. So again, we're back in the era of Moses here, probably perhaps in his lifetime. And it mentions his defeat of four Canaanite states. Quote, Canaan is captive with all woe. Ashkelon is conquered, Gezer seized, Yanoam made non-existent. Israel lies waste, its seed no longer exists. This is the only Egyptian document that mentions Israel, and this is the earliest reference to Israel that has come down to us. Time for our major topic of the evening, which is papyrus and parchment. We've now moved from these early forms of writing to the two major forms of writing. Papyrus comes from a plant, the papyrus plant. The Greeks had two words for this plant. One of them was cartes, and from that, the Latins borrowed the word carta, from which we get chart, charter, card. The other word was papyrus, excuse me, papyrus. Papyrus is a Egyptian word which the Greeks borrowed from the Egyptians, and they used it to refer either to the plant or to the scrolls that were made of this material. From that word, of course, papyrus, we get paper. The papyrus plant is a water plant. It grows in marshes like the Nile Delta. In abundance, it was a major export uh, for the ancient Egyptians. It barely grew anywhere outside Egypt. There's some reference to it in Syria, but not much. So basically, Egypt supplied the entire Mediterranean basin with this writing material. It really doesn't come into its own outside Egypt all that much until after around 1,000. That's why we're bringing it up now. It grows to about 15 feet at most. It has a uh, branchless stalk which is triangular, if you slice it and look down on it. Up at the top, there's a fan with fronds at the top, like, like a fan you'd use this way. And thousands of these wave in the wind. They say it's quite a striking sight. We have a description of how papyrus plant was made into papyrus roll. And here's the description. This is from Pliny the Elder, who was a Roman uh, naturalist. This is from his Naturalis Historia. 
uh, dating around 60 AD. But he traveled to Egypt and saw what the factories making papyrus were like in Alexandria. Here's what he says. Paper, meaning papyrus, is made from the papyrus by splitting it with a needle into very thin slices. Due care being taken that they should be as broad as possible. That of the first quality is taken from the center of the plant, and so in regular succession. <coughs> Excuse me. The leaves of papyrus are laid upon a table lengthwise, as long indeed as the papyrus will admit of, the jagged edges being cut off at either end, <coughs> after which a cross layer is placed over it. The leaves are pressed together and then dried in the sun, after which they are united to one another, the best sheets being always taken first and the inferior ones added afterward. Pliny also mentions that uh, scrolls don't exceed 20 sheets. We believe, since we know of lots of scrolls much longer than that, we think what he meant was when they were put out for wholesale to the rest of the Mediterranean, they usually were in bales of 20 sheet rolls. So if you were a retailer living in Athens, let's say, and you're a bookseller, and you, you bring in a shipment of papyrus, which you're going to sell as a stationer, stationary shop, you would take an order someone might only need a single sheet, in which case you'll undo the bale and snip off one sheet and sell that to a person. One sheet of papyrus would have been sufficient for the second letter of John or the third letter of John, for example. Or if somebody needs a scroll, he's going to write a long text, I unroll the bale to whatever length he needs and sell it to him. Suppose he comes back a week later and says, well, I used it all up and I still got two chapters to copy. Well, no problem. You simply cut off some more, glue it on, he finishes off the text. Or if he turned out to have overestimated and he's got three sheets blank at the end, he can cut them off, bring them to me, I'll buy them back and sell them. Egyptian papyri sheets individual sheets before they were glued into rolls, were unusually large, sometimes up to 15 inches square, a foot and a half almost. Greek papyri are almost always much smaller. The average Greek papyrus was about 10 inches high and seven and a half inches wide. Well, given, let's say, nine inches as a typical width for an individual sheet. If we take Pliny's number of 20 sheets and multiply that, what you wind up with is a scroll of about 15 feet. That would seem to be the wholesale size of papyrus rolls as they came blank from the factory. We have, however, found scrolls much larger than that. Um, they're very rarely longer than 35 feet. 35 feet was sufficiently long to hold two to three books of Homer's Iliad. Homer's Iliad is 24 books. What's 24 divided by three? Whatever you said, that's how many it would take. <laughs> or 35 foot scroll, which is basically I'm six feet, so flip me over several times. <laughs> it's, al it's almost the distance here, isn't it, of the auditorium from wall to wall? Something like that. It would also hold two books of Plato's Republic. Plato's Republic is 10 books, so you'd have to have five of these 35-foot scrolls to get Plato's Republic. Uh, most interestingly, 35 feet is what would be needed to copy the entire Gospel of Luke. Luke is the longest of all four Gospels by a considerable amount. Matthew isn't that much shorter. He would have occupied a scroll not that much shorter than 35 feet. 
John something less. Mark is only about two-thirds the size of Matthew and Luke, so he would not have required as much to write on. Some scrolls we have found are just absurdly huge. We have a 50-yard scroll. This is a uh, copy of the Iliad. Uh, excuse me, we don't have it. We have references to it. Uh, there are references to the whole Odyssey being on a scroll, which they estimate to be about 50 yards. We have some liturgical texts from Egyptian religion, which are 100 yards long. Imagine a scroll the entire length of a football field. The head librarian, Jim will appreciate this, the head librarian at the Library of Alexandria, the greatest library in the ancient world, was a fellow named Callimachus around uh, 250 BC, he had a saying which was, in Greek, mega biblion mega kakon, which means big book, big bad. <laughs> <laughs> Writing instruments were of course necessary. The reed pen to write on papyrus, started to be used to write on papyrus. Um, as early as the 900s, we have evidence for it. <coughs> There's an interesting statement in Jeremiah, chapter eight, verse eight. How can you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us when in fact the false pen of the scribes has made the law into a lie? That word there for pen in Hebrew is a reference to a reed pen. Quill pens, which is to say, pluck a feather from a bird and start using it, was an invention of the Greeks. It showed up about 200 BC. Most of the Dead Sea Scrolls were made with quill pens. Scrolls were written normally in columns. We do have some examples, very few, where the entire length of the scroll is written in one huge line after another. Now, is that absurd or what? <laughs> because you'd have to unroll it from beginning to end to read the first line and then roll back and then unroll it to read the second line. It obviously makes much more sense to use columns and just read columns as you roll and unroll. Average columns of Greek manuscripts are about three inches wide. Average columns of Latin manuscripts are about eight inches wide. Uh, the Romans had apparently taken speed reading courses, <laughs> knew how to absorb this. Many rolls have about 100 columns on them. The word for column in Latin is pagina, and that's where we get our word page. There were various quality grades of paper. You know, you go in an office depot and they got all these various, here's resume paper and 40 bond and so on. They had all this back then. In Rome, there were 10 grades of paper from very coarse to exquisitely fine. When a scroll had been copied, the text was finished, it was ready for sale, the bookseller would insert into the end of the rolled up document a little label, either made of parchment or papyrus, and on it he would put the title of the work, he would put sometimes a table of contents, so if it's Plato's Republic, you might have each of the 10 books briefly described. Uh, often the price of the book would be there, but a lot of times not, so that he could negotiate. Sometimes instead of a label, there would be a colophon. Colophon means that all this information was put at the very end of the book. Now, most scrolls back then were done on single sticks. We're familiar with the Hebrew Torah scrolls that we see in synagogues nowadays or on TV where you've got one stick at both ends, right? 
But ordinarily back then, it was kind of like cotton candy. You just roll it around a single stick. In fact, the Latin word for roll or scroll is volumen. Volvere means to rotate. That's where we get our word volume. Anyway, if you put the title of the work at the end, then that means you start reading it, you get all 35 feet through, you're rolling it up without a stick over here, till you get to the stick and there's the title, maybe the title, table of contents. Interestingly enough, French books nowadays, a lot of them still have the table of contents at the back of the book. Check that out sometime. Well, the implication is that you would leave the scroll that way so that the next person who comes to read it will see the title and know what it's all about. He'll re-roll it, just like, please rewind your videotape before you take it back to the library. <laughs> uh, in Greece and Rome, it was not common to copy on both sides of papyrus. Papyrus is a rather fragile material and rather thin. Um, so ordinarily, just the recto, which is where the strips of papyrus are horizontal. I, do you remember from Pliny's description? You put a, a row of papyri strips, and then you put another row perpendicular, press them together, put them in the sun. The front would be where they're horizontal, and the verso or back would be where they're vertical. Ordinarily, you wouldn't write on the vertical part. What evidence do we have of use of papyrus in ancient Israel? Well, I have two to mention. The first dates from about 750 BC, back in the period of the Judean and Israelite kings. It's referred to as Papyrus Murabaat 17 because it was papyrus, but it was found in a cave at a place called Murabaat. Remember the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in the mid-40s, 1947? This got everybody so excited that archaeologists from all over the globe descended upon Israel and started, or Jordan at the time, became Israel the next year, 1948, descended upon the Jordan Valley and started looking through all the caves they could find. There were caves 12 miles south of Qumran at this place called Murabaat, and in four of those caves, they found documents. They're usually lumped in with the Dead Sea Scrolls, although technically they're not from the same site. Among them, the 17th one to be numbered in sequence, is the only Hebrew papyrus prior to 587, from the time of the kings. It's also the oldest papyrus of any kind, anywhere, found outside Egypt. The letter, it's a letter, it belongs to the period of King Uzziah, and it refers to economic activity that is going on at the time of King Uzziah. Here is what 2 Chronicles 26 says. Uzziah rebuilt Eloth and restored it to Judah. God helped him against the Philistines, against the Arabs who lived in Gurbaal, and against the Meunites. He built towers in the wilderness and hewed out many cisterns, for he had large herds both, uh, in, on both sides of the central mountain ridge. And he had farmers and vine dressers in the hills and in the fertile lands, for he loved the soil. The second instance of a papyrus document in Hebrew that has come down to us from Old Testament times is called the Nash, well, the Nash papyrus, probably from Old Testament times. Most scholars date it anywhere from 200 to 1 BC. A minority say it's anywhere from 1 to 200 AD. At any rate, um, the Nash papyrus has the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments on it. But 
There are two versions of the Ten Commandments that occur in the Old Testament. One of them occurs in Exodus 20. The other occurs in Deuteronomy 6. Five, excuse me. This papyrus has blended the two together and given us a form of the Decalogue, which is neither of the two. It also includes the Shema. The Shema is that passage that I read that starts, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall have no other gods before you. That's about it for Old Testament papyrus, because papyrus was not all that popular in Israel. We, we have lots of papyrus uh, from medieval Hebrew manuscripts, but for Old Testament times, that's about it. Reason being that a second type of material was far more popular, and that is parchment. Parchment is leather. Well, it's not leather, actually. It's animal hides. But once you take the animal, once you take the hide off an animal, actually it's a skin when it's on him. It's a hide once it's off. Once you take the skin off an animal and it becomes a hide, you got two choices. You can soak it in tannin. Tannin is a chemical substance that the ancients got out of oak bark and it will make the skin pliable and usable for all kinds of things, shoes, belts, whatever. That's leather. Leather is tanned with tannin. Or instead of using oak bark tannin, you can soak it in lime. Lime is kind of a generic name for a variety of minerals, mineral salts. Soak it in that for eight or 10 days, stir it occasionally, a couple times a day. It will come out and not only be pliable, but also be excellent material for writing on. So if you want it for clothing, tan it, then you've got leather. If you want it for writing, soak it in lime and it becomes parchment. Now parchment shows up relatively late, this, this more sophisticated form of animal hide writing material. It gets its name from the city of Pergamum, the king of Egypt had the greatest library in the world in Alexandria, but he heard that the king of Pergamum, Pergamum is up in Asia Minor, present-day Turkey, was building up his own library, and the king of Egypt was getting worried that maybe this other library is going to be better than his. So the king of Egypt put a uh, protectionist ban on the export of papyrus. He said, I'll fix that guy. He won't have anything to write on, and then his library can't grow. Well, the king of Pergamum, Pergamum uh, invented this method of creating animal skin to write on as a way in which to go around that uh, imposed ban. And that's why from the word Pergamum comes the word parchment. Is this a true story or is it a legend? Nobody knows for sure. But the earliest parchments, the earliest parchment references and the earliest parchments found are from around 200 BC, which is basically when uh, Eumenes, king of Pergamum, supposedly invented parchment. So maybe it is true. Parchment has a lot of advantages over papyrus. Um, you can write on both sides. Actually, of course, you clean all the hair off one side and you clean all the fat off the other side. The side with the hair actually turns out the whiter of the two. And the side with the flesh actually turns out the darker of the two. But that, that one side you can polish to a beautiful sheen and it'll have no friction on your pen. Uh, uh, Frederick Kenyon, one of the greatest students of ancient manuscripts in the, in the 20th century, died not too long ago, said, uh, parchment 
In its semi-transparent fineness and the striking beauty of its polish, especially on the hair side, is the most beautiful writing material that has ever been invented. But of course it had some disadvantages too. Animal skins are a heck of a lot more costly than stuff made from a plant. Not just the expense, but also the uh, heaviness of the material. Leather's much more heavy. Gutenberg, when he made his Gutenberg Bible in 1455 or 1456, he made a, a couple of hundred paper ones because paper had entered from China through the Arabs to Europe in the 1100s, beginning of the 1100s, and had become common in the 1400s. But he also made 35 copies of his Bible on parchment. And if every single one of those took about 175 calves to make. That's a fortune. Every single one of those cost a fortune to make. You can see why not everybody in the Middle Ages had a Bible. It, it was lucky if you had one per village in the churches. Now, we come to the most important chapter in the Bible concerning the material on which the Old Testament was written. And this is Jeremiah chapter 36. I'm going to read it to you with a, occasional deletions, but basically this is the, what it says. In the fourth year of King Jehoiakim, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord, quote, take a scroll and write on it all the words that I have spoken to you against Israel and Judah and all the nations. Then Jeremiah called Baruch, son of Neriah, and Baruch wrote on a scroll at Jeremiah's dictation all the words of the Lord that he had spoken to him. Two quick comments. The word for scroll here in Hebrew is megalat sefer. Megalat is leather. Sefer is document, so a leather document of some kind. Excuse me, megaloth is not leather, it's roll. Um, second comment, why did Jeremiah not write these words himself? Why call in a secretary to do it? Maybe he was illiterate. Literacy was not big back then the way it is now. Well, in the fifth year of King Jehoiakim, all the people held a fast before the Lord. Then in the hearing of all the people, Baruch read the words of Jeremiah from the scroll in the temple. All the officials said to Baruch, we have to report all this to the king. The officials report to the king. The king commands Baruch to come to the palace with the scroll of Jeremiah's oracles. And here's what happened. The king was sitting in his winter apartment. There was a fire burning in the brazier before him. As the scroll was read, three or four columns, the king would cut them off with a penknife and throw them into the fire in the brazier until the entire scroll was consumed in the fire that was in the brazier. And that's why there's no book of Jeremiah in the Old Testament. Of course there is. But we're told Jeremiah called Baruch back and said, okay, let's do it again. And they rewrote it. Now, that is an interesting passage because it refers to scrolls. So this kind of, uh, Jeremiah lived around 600. This assures us that most of the biblical books back then would have, been on, would have been written on scrolls. The question is, were they papyrus scrolls or were they leather scrolls, parchment scrolls? Back then, it probably would have been actual leather rather than parchment. Well, unfortunately, it doesn't say. 
there is some indication that it might be uh, leather because the Mishnah uses the word megala for leather parchment, and that's a, a bit after Jesus' time. On the other hand, the king, after he hears two or three words telling him, telling him that he's going to be crushed by his foreign enemies, sliced it off and threw it in the fire. An act of arrogance, of course. The fact that he could slice it off with a pen, it doesn't eliminate the possibility of leather. But on the other hand, it'd be a lot easier with papyrus. So we don't really know which is the case. This brings us to the Dead Sea Scrolls. Most of the Dead Sea Scrolls are on parchment. They are on leather. They are not on papyrus, although we have found some papyrus. With the Dead Sea Scrolls, we also come upon the last of the forms of writing that I want to mention tonight, and that's the Codex. Codex is a company that makes cameras. No. <laughs> Codex is the Latin word for not a rolled up papyrus scroll or not a rolled up parchment scroll. People finally wised up about a hundred years before Jesus. Somebody came up with the idea of taking the scroll and slicing it into squares and stacking it and sewing it on one side, and then you can very easily go wherever you want to go. If you have a scroll of Isaiah, 66 chapters long, and you're reading along, and you're reading along, and you get to chapter 48, and say to yourself, gosh, that reminds me of something in chapter three. <laughs> 20 minutes later, oh, no, I guess not. <laughs> but with this wonderful new invention, the Codex, you could instantly go wherever you want. Who latches on to this invention? Not the Greeks, not the Romans. They're, they're kind of bound by the cultural inertia of the scroll form that they're all used to. The group that latches on to this immediately is the Christians. And it was, it was with the growth of the Christian movement that the transition from scrolls and papyrus fundamentally takes over to codex and parchment. Consequently, from then throughout the Middle Ages up to the invention of printing about 1450, the parchment codex rules. And all of those medieval monasteries with the monks hunched over six hours a day copying books. They were doing it on animal skins. And that's why we have a lot of those still around because parchment is a wonderfully durable substance. I would love to entertain maybe five or 10 minutes of questions. It's five till nine. I don't want to delay the reception too much, but I think we have a little bit of time. Hi. Why do you think the Christians uh, picked up on the codex, the book form? Because the greatest advantage to a codex over a roll is using a text as a reference. So that the way we do now, you know, uh, if I want to find out what does Psalm 38, 6 say, bam, I'm there. With a scroll, you pull down the scroll, you get over to it. So I think it's because the Christians wanted to use the scriptures for reference purposes. And then they started putting all of their literature on it, the early church fathers, and then pretty soon, as Christianity took over the Roman Empire, all literature of all kinds was from then on done on parchment codices. Uh, you haven't mentioned anything about the difference between an oral culture and then writing, and so the transition from an oral remembering of um, ideas and texts to writing. I know a bit about that in the Greek tradition, but I don't know at all anything about it in uh, the Hebrew tradition. So when the early books of the Bible were, were put down, did they exist 
first in an oral tradition that was handed on orally, or is it this purely a phenomenon that's associated with writing? Uh, I have not studied that question, but it, if so this is off the top of my head, but it seems to me that when one looks at the earliest traditions that have, that have been recorded in the scriptures, namely those first 11 chapters of Genesis, which are often referred to as the primitive history. Uh, you have the story of the creation, the Garden of Eden, the fall, um, Cain and Abel, Noah and the flood, the Tower of Babel. Those stories are so rounded and spare of detail that they remind me of pebbles in a brook. You know how water over the years makes pebbles all nice and round? That's to me a sign of oral transmission. And so I think uh, surely those uh, narratives were handed down mouth to mouth. Uh, I can imagine uh, a little Hebrew boy sitting with his dad at a campfire one night saying, pulling on his robe, tell me another story, Daddy. And he says, well, last night I told you the Garden of Eden, Tower of Babel. <laughs> so I think that there are those signs. How far they go down, well, the stories of the judges even, which are from the period 1200 to 1020, uh, have some of those characteristics also. So uh, the question of literacy in the ancient world is extremely difficult to determine. Some people I've read claim that with the invention of the alphabet, virtually everybody almost instantly became literate. Other scholars I've read on the question of ancient literacy, in fact, there's a book called Ancient Literacy by a Harvard professor, claim the opposite, that literacy never achieved more than 10, 20% of the population. So it's a difficult question. I, I wish I knew more. But that's something I can study for next year. There you go. Yeah. Thank you all.